before the democratization of status and social media, where anybody with an iPhone and a bit of cheeky personality could become a megastar thanks to apps like Instagram, TikTok, or, dare I say, even YouTube itself. Society certainly had what today we would call influencers, but they were surely a cut above the folly and hijinks exhibited by the Jake Pauls and Kim Kardashians of the world. Indeed, the Astors, a lineage directly descended from America's very first multimillionaire, were the epitome of American high society. Holding a family name synonymous with opulence and social influence during the 19th and early 20th centuries. In today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we'll explain, step by step, how this legendary old money dynasty created high society as we know it, wielding social savvy, political clout and strategic marriages to serve as the architects of New York City's social norms for the 1% of the 1%. Long before John Jacob Astor ascended as America's first multimillionaire wealth in the early 19th century, the 13 British colonies and later the fledgling United States were already the domain of established families of considerable means. For generations, these families had held sway over the nation's political landscape, and their roots often stretched back to the period before the American Revolution. You see, the forebears of these families accumulated their fortunes through a myriad of avenues, among them elite planters, prosperous merchants, slave owners, shipbuilders. Additionally, geography played its role. In states such as Virginia, Maryland and the Carolinas, acres upon acres of land, either bestowed by British royalty or gained through colonial era so-called head rights, formed the bedrock of these families' prosperity. And their legacy was often not merely one of wealth, but of statesmanship. Indeed, they counted among their numbers several of the founding fathers and the early presidents of the United States, men who would stand in the crucible of revolution and constitutional formation. Yet, with all of that said, the American colonies had been largely peopled by those whom historians describe as the middling sort, what we today would identify as the middle class. Certainly, America was not a land of hereditary aristocracy. Rather, it was a place where wealth alone could elevate one's standing. And the Founding Fathers themselves were instrumental in rejecting monarchy and hereditary aristocracy as they structured the nation's governance. For this, their intellectual inspirations were varied. First, they took cues from Europe's first written constitution, the Magna Carta, celebrating its challenge to monarchical authority. Men like the future third US President Thomas Jefferson saw the new American elite as a natural aristocracy, one founded not on birthright, but on merit and ability. For example, Alexander Hamilton, born out of wedlock and hailing from humble beginnings in the Caribbean, or Benjamin Franklin, a son of a candle maker, could ascend to the pinnacle of American society through sheer grit and intellect. By contrast, Germany, the ancestral home of the Astors, was a veritable mosaic of principalities and kingdoms, each underpinned by its own rigid aristocratic structure. Indeed, the Astors could never have ascended the social ladder in their German homeland as they did in America's more fluid society. Thus, as the early 1800s unfurled, America was a land of disparate centers of wealth and influence. Both new money and old money mingled, yet there was no centralized high society. Therefore, America was, at the time, a vacuum that would soon draw in the likes of the entrepreneurial Astors. Now, in a nation still forming its identity, John Jacob Astor emerged as an archetype of American capitalism. Born in Germany, he crossed the Atlantic to establish himself as a fur trader and soon became America's first multimillionaire. Specifically, Astor's arrival in New York in 1786 marked the dawn of his business endeavors. Acquiring knowledge of the fur trade during his voyage to the New World, he opened a fur goods shop in Manhattan. And Astor was not one to squander an opportunity. The Jay Treaty of 1794, which opened new Canadian markets and the Great Lakes region, proved fortuitous for him. His shrewd negotiations with native tribes and market insights allowed him to accumulate a quarter of a million dollars by the year 1800, effectively crowning him the undisputed magnate of the fur trade. But John Jacob Astor's ventures were not confined to furs alone. In 1834, the Astor House, New York City's first luxury hotel, welcomed its first guests. Astor had meticulously gathered parcels of land around his previous residence, effectively claiming an entire city block in what was then the city's most elegant quarter. 
Situated on the west side of Broadway, the Astor House was a stone's throw away from City Hall Park and the offices of the New York Herald. For decades, this establishment remained the lodestar for the elite and the famous, the venue where authors and statesmen mingled in opulent settings. Indeed, it served as the blueprint for the city's future luxurious accommodations. Now, the patriarch of the Astor dynasty passed away in 1848, leaving a staggering $20 million, equal to over $770 million in today's currency, almost all of which was bequeathed to his son, William Backhouse Astor. Thus, the provisions of Astor's will were carefully engineered to preserve the family fortune for the generations to follow, a symbol of his calculating mind. By the 1850s, the Astor family had transcended their mercantile origins to become social arbiters of the First Order, and it was Caroline Shermerhorn Astor, William's wife, who most personified this new societal influence. The famed matriarch wielded almost dictatorial control over New York high society, and it was her annual Astor Ball that became the defining event of the city's social calendar. Now, during the 1870s, Caroline Astor, commonly known as the Mrs. Astor, wielded significant influence over American high society. Her Fifth Avenue mansion became the stage for defining the era's social etiquettes, where she hosted elaborate teas, receptions, and opulent late-night dinners. The pinnacle of her social calendar was an annual ball, set meticulously on a Monday night in January, where dinner was served at 11 p.m., and dancing continued until the break of day. Mrs. Astor would commonly be flanked by Ward McAllister, her confidant and co-architect of social exclusivity. Together, they orchestrated the Society of the Patriarchs, a club aimed at consolidating the creme de la creme of New York society. Now, the Patriarchs' balls were recurring events, held multiple times each season at Delmonico's, the city's premier dining establishment. Membership in the society came with certain privileges, each member could extend invitations to five women and four men for the various social events conceptualized by Caroline Astor. Those who met the society's stringent standards were granted entry into the 400, a term coined to represent the elite list of guests who could comfortably fit in Mrs. Astor's ballroom. This exclusive list included individuals of impeccable lineage, grandchildren of past presidents, European royalty, and heirs to monumental fortunes. Indeed, the 400 became synonymous with social exclusivity, setting the tone for who was considered in and out of the upper echelons of American society. Meanwhile, in 1887, Lewis Keller, a society columnist and golf aficionado, published the first social register, taking a cue from Mrs. Astor's famous 400 list. His compilation also included names from other notable lists effectively documenting those who made up New York's most distinguished visiting registers. Overseen by an anonymous advisory committee, the social register initially recorded over 5,000 individuals, many of whom were descendants of early American settlers. Historically, the list catered to American upper-class families, epitomizing the WASP stereotype. Amid this backdrop of social curating, tensions flared between the Astors and the Vanderbilts, the two titan families of the Gilded Age. Alva Vanderbilt, slighted for her absence on Mrs. Astor's coveted list, orchestrated an audacious counter-move. In 1883, after the completion of Petit Chateau, her extravagant Fifth Avenue residence, Alva dispatched 1,200 invitations for her masked ball. Hearing all the society chatter, Mrs. Astor's daughter, eager to attend the Vanderbilt Gala, thus persuaded her mother to pay a visit to Alva. Armed with a useful excuse to finally acknowledge the Vanderbilt's entry into high society, Mrs. Astor joined in Alva's festivities, marking a twisted tale of social rivalry in a setting already steeped in exclusivity and one-upmanship. Now, the Astor-led high society annual social cycle of Gilded Age New York commenced in November and extended until the onset of Lent. During spring, society's finest would frequent the courts of England and Europe only to return for a stateside summer. This recurring sequence of events, including balls and dinner parties, was not just a social fixture, but also held political relevance, as many members of the US Parliament partook in these social rights. Subsequently, Caroline Astor, partnered with her confidant Ward McAllister, aimed to formalize the rules governing this rarefied social landscape. They were the self-appointed guardians of old money propriety laboring to sift the worthy from the unworthy newcomers. However, 
Simultaneously, as the American Astor family's influence was reaching its apogee in the United States, an ocean away, the family's tendrils were extending into British society. In 1893, William Waldorf Astor, disenchanted by familial discord on American soil, took up residence in England, and the estate of Cliveden in Taplow, Buckinghamshire, once the province of the Duke of Westminster, soon became the Astor's palatial refuge. Then in 1906, as if anointing the Union of Continents, William Waldorf bestowed Cliveden upon his son, Waldorf Astor, and his new American bride, Nancy Langhorn. Nancy Langhorn hailed from Virginia, born into fluctuating fortunes that eventually swelled by the close of the 19th century. Thus, her marriage to Waldorf in 1906 was something of an international alliance, not only merging family wealth, but also social ambitions. With political aspirations in his eyes and the influence of his well-connected wife, Waldorf became the unionist candidate for Plymouth in 1908. Nancy, ever the devoted spouse, campaigned ardently at his side until he took his seat in Parliament two years later. And British society warmed to Nancy, captivated by her American ebullience and sharp wit. Thus, in Albion, the Astors were a harmonious pair, both American expatriates of similar temperament. Remarkably, they were even born on the same day, the 19th of May, 1879. As hostess of Cliveden, Nancy became renowned, drawing luminaries from Charlie Chaplin and George Bernard Shaw to Winston Churchill into their social sphere. Then, in 1919, an unforeseen twist of fate. Waldorf was elevated to the House of Lords, necessitating his departure from the House of Commons. Into the vacuum stepped Nancy, who won his seat and made history as the first woman to sit in Parliament. Over a span of 26 years, she wielded her influence in the advocacy of diverse causes, shortened working hours, enhanced health care for mothers, pensions for widows, and equal employment opportunities for women. But Virginia always occupied a special place in her heart. A portrait believed to depict Pocahontas was her gift to the Commonwealth in 1926. However, despite her groundbreaking career, Nancy encountered formidable resistance, including from none other than Winston Churchill. Yet her tenure in Parliament set a precedent that reverberated through the halls of power, unsettling traditional gender norms and shaping a new pathway for women in politics. Simultaneously, her wealth, social standing and vast network of connections became essential assets in her political endeavours. Therefore, while the family maintained a formidable presence in American high society, the British chapter of the Astor legacy was inscribing itself. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s, Waldorf and Nancy became staples in the British social fabric. Cliveden was not just their home, but an international salon of intellect, influence and elegance. Nancy, the hostess with an unyielding political spirit, was perceived as among the world's most notable women. Cliveden, the epitome of their transatlantic melding of societies, continued to be the stage for this remarkable American-British drama. But as the fur trade, once a cornerstone of Astor prosperity, dwindled and real estate ventures faced turbulence in an evolving urban landscape, the family found their once impervious status diminishing. Now, the ebbing of the Astor family's fortunes was a gradual process that spanned the late 19th to the 20th century, catalyzed by shifting economic terrains and societal perceptions, and accusations of being slumlords further marred their standing. A maritime calamity, the sinking of the Titanic, cemented a regrettably certain end to the Astor Dominion in New York society. Among the ship's casualties was John Jacob Astor IV, the most affluent passenger aboard. His wife, Madeline Force Astor, survived the tragedy and subsequently gave birth to their son, John Jacob Astor VI, and Madeline herself was a figure of social intrigue, her marriage to John Jacob Astor IV having provoked scandal due to their age difference and his recent divorce. When several clergy members refused to officiate their wedding, the minister who eventually stepped in faced such backlash that he felt compelled to resign. Decades later, as World War II erupted, the Astor influence across the Atlantic saw another significant recalibration. Nancy Astor, now the Viscountess Astor, was deeply engaged in political life and philanthropy throughout the conflict. Yet her political standing eroded over the course of the war. Believing her party and husband considered her a liability, she retired from politics in 1945. 
and World War II itself wrought significant changes on the British home front, including the mobilization of women into various forms of labor, yet it did little to modernize their post-war ambitions, which largely remained anchored in tradition. In the next decade, the 1950s, the divestment of American assets signified another phase in the family's retrenchment. John Jacob Astor VI, who was born in the shadow of the Titanic disaster, had overseen the Astor estate in Basking Ridge. But in 1960, he abandoned this property. It laid vacant until its acquisition by Bernard's Township in 1968 for $140,000. Furthermore, the wane of the Astor influence during the latter half of the 20th century symbolized a broader societal shift. The concept of high society, once the near-exclusive realm of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, began to diversify, making room for emergent families like the Irish Catholic Kennedys. Yet, the Astor legacy is far from erased, and it persists through philanthropic works such as the New York Public Library, a variety of New York City landmarks and streets, and titles that remain with the family's English descendants, including Viscount Astor and Baron Astor of Hever. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. Do you find the Astor's creation and maintenance of high society as an admirable and glamorous social development, or do you think it was a form of snobbery? We're looking forward to your thoughts. And if you'd like a deeper dive on this illustrious old money dynasty, why not click the video on screen to watch our long-form documentary on the entire history of the Astor family from start to finish. We'll see you there or in the community below. Thanks again for your continued viewership with us here at Old Money Luxury, and cheers until next time.